Well, good morning, Heritage Church. My name's Suzanne. I have the tremendous gift of being one of the pastors here. We're so glad to see you in worship this morning. Um, when you came in, you were given a connection card. This tells you everything happening in the life of Heritage Church. Make sure you take a look at that as you analyze it. Um, we are in the middle of our summer blockbuster series. And in this series, we've been looking at the spiritual themes in the summer's hottest movies. So if you're our guest here this morning, you might have seen popcorn everywhere and, and all that. But we just do that kind of as a nod to the movies. Um, um, the song that Tom just performed for us, the Let It Be song, is a nod to the movie that we're going to be looking at this morning. You know, we do this series because we believe that God is everywhere, that you can see the divine, that you can see God in anything you do. You can hear it in a secular song. You can hear it in a movie. Scripture tells us that we should have eyes to see and ears to hear, and I believe we should have a heart to feel the power of God's presence around us each and every day. Now, as we get started this morning, if you're our guest here this morning, we welcome you. We know you have lots of choices and places to worship, so it's a gift to have you here as our guest. Now, we have a lot of people who continually come into our church, and we really want to know who you are. We want to know your name. So if you could just text new there, and you'll get, a, you'll get a text back. That's our church number there at the bottom of the screen. If you would text that to us, if you don't want to, you can fill out the connection card you were given and write your name on that just so that we can begin to memorize your name as well. If you're a regular tender, you can just text here. And each uh, uh, first Sunday of every month, we have an event called Pizza with the Pastors, where you can just come in and have some pizza with us, and we get to know you. I did want to give a little shout out. One of our young men just got back from basic training in tech school, Logan Howe. Would y'all give it up for him for serving our country? Right over here, one of our former youth. Logan, we're so very, very proud of you and all that you've done. If you're our guest here this morning and you're out checking out churches in the community and we're not the right flavor for you, please let us know. Um, we know of many churches in this community that are doing great things for God and we'd be glad to help you find the place where you can grow and serve Christ best. But as we get started this morning, I want to show you the preview to this week's film. <laughs> Until a month ago, you were a complete failure. <laughs> and then somehow, you became the biggest star in the world. As if by magic. So what happened? Jeez. Yesterday. All my troubles seem so far away. Oh, I believe in yesterday. When did you write that? I didn't write it. Paul McCartney wrote it. The Beatles. Who? John, Paul, George, and Ringo. The Beatles. No. Stop it. Yesterday. It's one of the greatest songs ever written. Well, it's not Coldplay. It's not Fix You. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes. I'm just uh, listening to Jack's new song. Oh, yeah! What's this one called? Uh, leave It Be. Let It Be. Well, rock on, Jack! Word has got out about a new pop phenomenon. <laughs> Your music, it's incredible. We need you to come to L.A. I'm offering you money and fame. Hello, Mr. Sheeran. Love your work, man. Especially the rapping. Oh, really? No, I'm really kidding. No, I'll leave it to the brothers. That'd be my advice. Hey, June. You're leaving, so I can ask you anything. How did I get in the friend column instead of the and I love her column? Jake Mallet, we're a superstar! We could have been the perfect match. But now, you're the world's greatest songwriter. I'm not. Except that you probably are. It is my honor now to open this door for the moment the entire world has been waiting for. Nah, wrong door. Is it just you writing the songs? Yes. But is it? I, I don't know. <laughs> I've been a fool twice over. Perhaps love isn't all you need. But it's pretty close. With the song, I do have a suggestion. Hey, dude. Hey, dude, are you sure? Hey, dude. He's right. That's better. So how many of you have seen it? Oh, wow. 
Well, definitely, if you haven't seen it, I know it's still in the theaters, but if you hadn't, you're definitely going to want to rent it later. It's a rom-com, and guys, I know, but we have to do at least one romantic comedy as we go through. The critics called it sweet and charming. It's the story of a musician named Jack who's been trying to be a musician. You know, he's working jobs on the side. He goes to all these gigs. You know, he travels these long distances and plays for three people, and he's trying to make it. He's got this girl who helps him and carries his gear. She's kind of his roadie and all that. And then one night, he, he decides he's over. It's done. I'm just, I'm, I'm, do I'm done chasing this dream. It's over. And about that time, they have this incident in the movie. You saw a glimpse of it in the preview where all the power goes off, and he has an accident on his bike and the next morning he's kind of just singing the song yesterday by the Beatles as you saw and the whole world no one remembers the Beatles and so he decides well hey if nobody remembers the Beatles then maybe I'll take their songs and so he's trying in his brain to remember every lyric you know that has ever been written about the Beatles and um, the story continues on and I won't give you the ending away so that you can go back and see it for yourself but you know what's interesting about this film is that the Beatles are still making bank. I mean, they're still making money. Just to use the Beatles songs, uh, the filmmakers had to pay the Beatles $10 million. Don't you wish you just wrote one song that somebody would, you know, pay you a couple thousand for? They got $10 million for their music. And, this, and the film is based on the song Yesterday. Um, yesterday was written in 1965, and Paul McCartney wrote, wrote, came up with the tune. One morning he woke up, and he came up with this tune for the song of yesterday. And so then he was running around to all these people going, does anybody recognize the tune? Does anybody know? And he said eventually it kind of felt like, like when you find something, you try to take it back to the police station, and nobody would take it. So he said, okay, well, I guess I did come up with the tune. And so he does this, and in the beginning, the song yesterday um, had absolutely no lyrics. All he had was the tune. He just woke up and had the tune. So Paul McCartney and John Lennon, they decided that they, you know, that when they were writing songs, they would, you know, I mean, y'all know they wrote a gazillion. How many of you are Beatles fans in here? Maybe like the Beatles, yeah. And they wrote all these songs. And even if you don't like the Beatles, you've heard the Beatles. Can I get an amen, right? You know, and so, you know, everybody knows about the Beatles. So John Lennon and Paul McCartney teamed up on a lot of things. And when they couldn't come up with a lyric to a tune, they would substitute scrambled eggs. So the original title of yesterday was Scrambled Eggs. Oh, I wish she had good legs, because then she'd make me scrambled eggs. But that's how it went, okay? I can't sing. Sorry about that. But anyway, that's, you know, kind of how it goes. And so um, this song was voted by MTV and Rolling Stone magazine as the number one pop song of all time. The song, Yesterday. And um, it's been covered. You know how they do covers of, of original songs? It's one of the most covered songs in history. 2,200 different artists have covered the song, Yesterday. When you think about the song yesterday, it's a song about a guy who, you know, he, he had this girl and he, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. He said some stuff he shouldn't have said and she's gone and how he longs for yesterday. And it's a song that's just filled with regret. The movie speaks to us about regret. And if we're honest, our lives each and every day speak to us about regret. Now, the concept of regret, regret is not a very fun topic to discuss, but it's one that we all experience in some way, shape, or form. Regret is loss or sorrow over something that could have been. And sometimes, when we have bad outcomes in our lives, we, we blame ourselves. And regret has some cousins, guilt, and shame, and condemnation. And if we're honest... We've all said or done something that we wish we wouldn't have done. We all wish that there was something that we could take back, that we could just rewind the clock, not have said the insensitive thing, not have done the wrong thing. We all have those moments in our lives. And you know, the people in the Bible are no different than us. We have all this modern technology and they didn't have it, but humans are humans. The same heartbeat feelings and who and what we are they just echo across the centuries. And so the Apostle Paul, we're going to look at something that he wrote to a church, a church in Philippi. And he was writing to them a little bit about this, this concept of, of regret. And he was writing to them a whole lot about how we should live this Christian journey. Because our God, remember this if you remember nothing else this morning, our God does not want us to live a life of regret. Paul said this in Philippians. Yes, Everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, 
all the regrets, all the stumbles, all the mistakes, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Our relationship with Christ is greater than all our regrets. And our God does not want us to live a life of regrets. But when it comes to regret, we need to recognize something. And we need to be real and admit that everybody has regrets. We have sayings in our world like, you know, live life with no you know, re regrets. Live like you were dying, you know. Uh, or we have people who say, I don't have any regrets. To which I say, I just don't really believe that. I believe a part of our humanity that we are going to have regrets. So I tried something as I was doing this. I, I, was, I was thinking a little bit. And I, and I was thinking, um, you know, what regrets do I have? And, you know, of course, some obvious things will pop up. And then I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to set a timer for five minutes. And I'm going to write down everything I can think of that I regret. So I'm going to share my list with you. And your list would be different. But maybe this week you could take that five minutes and just kind of spend a little time thinking about things that you regret. So I started off when I was little. And I said, I regret that, that I never had a grandfather. Like I see some of you that you have the gift of a grandfather in your life. I just kind of regret that. I, I wish I would have had that presence. I regret that uh, I grew up in a home that had some abuse. I, I regret that. That shaped me. I regret the mistakes that I made as a youth. I regret that when I was young, I didn't think I was smart enough to be a doctor. You know, um, I don't want to be a doctor now, FYI. But, um, but I regret that I didn't have enough confidence to know that really anything is possible, isn't it? Can I get an amen? I regret that I, didn't think I, was, that I just didn't think I was smart enough. I regret that I didn't become a Christian until I was 30 years old. I'm always so envious and so in awe of those of you that have been raised in the church and sometimes people have been raised in their church all their lives. They have this thing like, well, I don't really have a testimony. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you do. You have this testimony of this beautiful thread of grace that has weaved itself all throughout your life. It's a beautiful thing. I regret that um, I often would use careless words. I regret that I've hurt people. I regret the times that I didn't stand up for someone who needed somebody to stand up for them. I regret that I'm always not the wife I should be. Although not too bad, right, Michael? We're doing all right, yeah. I regret um, all the mom mistakes. Mom's in here, all the mom's mistakes. I, I regret the mom mistakes. Um, we all try to do better, but it's the hardest and best job in the world. Can I get an amen, moms? Dads, too. You know, we regret those. I regret the friends that I let slip away. I regret that. Um, I regret that I didn't spend more time getting myself to water. Water is really restorative for me. Anybody love water? I don't care. I, I just love to sit and look at water. I wish that I, I wish I would do that more. I regret the times that I've been selfish. I regret the times that I've taken people for granted. I regret that I don't, didn't have people over dinner, to dinner as often as I should because the house wasn't vacuumed. Can I get an amen? Anybody else? Yeah, I, I regret that. I wish you forget about that. I regret working too much. Um, you know, sometimes we act like we run a small country, <laughs> and we don't, right? I, I regret that, and I regret not reaching more people for Christ. You know, I'm not the only one that has regrets. We all have regrets. There was a nurse who worked in hospice care, and so she, in hospice care, she would ask these people as they were nearing the end of their lives, what do you regret? And so she began taking notes, and she actually wrote a book about it, and she compiled the five regrets that we most have when we're at the end of the life. And I think these are pretty, pretty uh, on point, and I also think that, that uh, it echoes some of the things that I just expressed in a little five-minute exercise. And here's what they had to say. I wish I'd had the courage to live my life and be true to myself and not be a slave to the expectations of others. It's a good one, huh? I wish I hadn't worked so hard. You know, uh, as a side note, um, I, Michael and I are often called to someone's bedside at the end of their lives or, you know, somebody, at, you know, around a funeral time. And without fail, everyone always says, I wish I wouldn't have worked so much. I wish I'd spent more time with my family. I wish I had, I'd, I'd had the courage to express my feelings. It's another thing people struggle with. You know, you just, you know, when we love somebody, we should tell them. And sometimes we don't. You know, so wish I had more courage. I wish I'd stayed in touch with friends. How many of you had friends just kind of melt away? Wish I'd worked harder on that. 
And then the last one I think is so powerful for us. I wish I would have just let myself be happy. You know, we are creatures of critique, aren't we? We're always telling ourselves in little and small ways that we're not enough. That we don't measure up. That we're never going to reach our potential. And we can't just be content and happy with the gifts that God has given us. You know, in the film, he's on this quest, on this journey, you know, to be famous, to be this amazing musician. And this got this girl, this girl who's been lugging his gear around for him for two years. And she says to him at one point in the film, why can't you just love me? And I think for a lot of us, when it comes to our regret, we've got people right in front of us saying that. Why can't you just love me? This Apostle Paul, he writes to us, he says, I no longer count on my own righteousness. I'm not going to get it all right through obeying the law. And I'm not going to get it all right through following the rules. Rather, I become righteous through my faith in Christ. If faith in Christ is the foundation, we will have less regrets. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. If we want to live a life with less regrets, we need to try and live our lives the way God told us to live our lives. You see, God does not want us to live lives full of regret. But it's more than recognizing our regrets. It's releasing our regrets. You know, a lot of people are stuck in regret. Have you ever met somebody who's talking about something that happened 15 years ago? I mean, they are stuck. And they're stuck in this awful loop in our mind of, if only. If only I wouldn't have done that. If only I wouldn't have said that. If only he would change. If only she would have done this. They're stuck in this loop. I was having a conversation one day with a young woman. She was in her uh, late 20s. And um, it was she, no, she was in her, in her mid-30s, late, mid to late 30s. And in her 20s, she had done something that she wasn't proud of. And she just kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it over all the times we'd meet. And finally, I said to her, how long are you going to pick up the tab for this? Have any of y'all had somebody who's still picking up the tab for something that happened years and years and years ago? It's so hard for us to release these things. So hard for us to let things go. In the movie, he has a hard time releasing his expectations of what the futures are going to go. And, and he's got these regrets and, and he, doesn't kinda, he doesn't really know what he can do to, to let them go. But he needs this release. We all need this release. Apostle Paul says this, I want to know Christ. So do we want to be friends with our regrets or do we want to be friends with Christ? And experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. You see, God wants to give you a life where you have power over your regrets. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Yeah, I, I know I'm going to have to suffer some. If I pull out my regrets and I pull a sheet out, you know, that's not going to be fun to do. But maybe I need to share in that suffering a little bit. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Do you understand that if you're going to have the new life, the abundant life, the real life that Christ called about, if we're going to have resurrection, something has to die. And something has to die in us. We have to release things. We have to let it go. Let go of the loss. Let go of the guilt. Let go of the shame. Remember that there is no condemnation in Christ because our God does not want you to live a life full of regrets. And then we have to remember that our God, our God wants to redeem it. Any regret you've had any regret you'll have today one you had tomorrow one into the future if you will allow God to come in God will use it you don't have to deny it you don't have to minimize it you need to know that God will use it you know in the film he talks about how he wants to drink he says he says these words this lady asks him she says do you want to drink from the chalice using religious imagery do you want to drink from the chalice of money and fame and power and he looks at her when one moment he says, I don't even know who I am anymore. God knows who we are. And God wants to redeem who we are. You know, in the film, it's kind of interesting. Nobody, the whole world forgets that the Beatles exist. But for some reason, two people know. Two people know. And they come to him. And he's afraid. And he thinks that because they know they're going to turn him in and it's going to be really bad and everybody is going to, you know, find out that he's a fraud and all this. And they come to him and they're so loving with him. And they tell him that, that, that even though he may have some regrets, that, that this music will be used for good. 
I think that's what God says to us when we come to him with all our regrets and our pain and our sorrow and our loss. God says, you know what? Give it to me. I can do something good with it. Apostle Paul says this. I don't mean to say I've achieved these things. You know what? None of us have. We haven't achieved victory over regrets. There's no such thing. Or that I've already re reached perfection. We know we're not perfect. So many of us try to act like we're perfect and everything has to be perfect and the whole world knows that perfection is an illusion. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. You know, a lot of us, it is so hard to let go of our past. It is hard to let go. For some of us, when it comes to our past and the regrets, and sometimes our regrets are things we've done. Sometimes the regrets are things that were done to us. It's hard for us to let it go. For, for, mo for many of us, our lives are kind of like we're in an automobile and we have a windshield, but we don't look at the windshield. We're just looking in the rearview mirror all the time. You know, that rearview mirror is a pretty small piece of what this life is about, isn't it? And what could our lives be like if we could just stop looking at the rearview mirror and look at the windshield and see what God has put in front of us? You know, if you do this Christian journey thing for a while, you discover a couple things. Number one, that our God loves us unconditionally. That no matter what you've done, no matter how far away you feel from God, no matter what is broken that you think cannot be repaired, that's when God can redeem it. That's when God can use it. And sometimes we just have to be real before God and we have to repent. We have to say, God, I messed up. And it doesn't mean that we say, God, I messed up and we keep doing what we're doing. That's not what repentance is. Repentance is we turn. We turn our behavior to what we were doing. We repent. And when we repent and we are, speak to God with our whole heart and our whole soul, God will redeem it. And God will use it for something good. You can bury your regret. You can bury your shame. You can bury this condemnation that you live under. Because Christ will wants you to live a life that is not full of regrets. You know the great thing about regrets is is that knowing all this and being a Christ follower and if you haven't begun a relationship with Christ and you've just wandered in here this morning I would love to talk to you. It changed my life at the age of 30 and it can change your life too. You see knowing this that our God is the God who doesn't want us to live a life of regret helps us today because we can reduce some of the mistakes that we made. We can break some of the power of regrets in our lives. Because our God always calls us to do something. So if there's someone you need to say something to today, pick up the phone this afternoon and say it. If there's something you need to do to make something right, go do it. If there's a relationship that you need to repair and you're stuck in the stalemate of stubbornness, fix it. If there's something that you need to stop doing and you are playing with dynamite and sin and something that could blow up your life, stop it. Stop it today. We can reduce these things in our lives. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. He says, he says no, dear brothers and sisters, I haven't achieved it. But I, I focus on one thing. You see, we can focus on our regrets. We can focus on our past or we can focus on one thing. He says, I focus on forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. You see, our regrets will be reduced when we learn to focus on Christ and what Christ is doing on into our future. Our God does not want us to live a life of regrets. In the movie, there comes a point in time where he is weighed down. He is weighed down by the regrets. Things that have happened in the story. And things that have happened in our lives. And I think. That when we gather together as a people. There are a whole lot more of us weighed down by regret. Than we care to admit. And we don't talk about it. Because it's not, certainly not entertaining. And it's certainly not a fun subject. But it's a real subject. And it holds a lot of us down. And so he decides that he's going to come clean. And when he does, that's when he gets everything he ever wanted. And know this, there's a God who wants you to get everything you ever wanted that God wants you to have. Now following Christ doesn't mean you always get everything you want. 
But it does mean that God will always give you everything you need. Our God does not want us to live lives of regret. And so we have this concept of regret. You know what I think? I think we're all students. I think we're all students of regret. This morning I ask you on your next step, as we're students of, because if we're students of regret, we should learn. On your next step, I said, the one thing, I ask you to pick one thing. The one thing I don't want to regret in my life is what? What's one thing in your life that you don't ever want to regret? And the next step is, I will do the following to make sure that I don't regret it. Maybe you don't spend enough time with your kids. Maybe there's a family member you haven't spoken to in years. Maybe you worship the things of this world and have ceased to worship the living God. Whatever it is, God does not want you to live a life of regret. You know, in the movie, this guy is on this quest, and I think it's a quest that a lot of us are on. Sometimes we're on this quest for significance and, and meaning, and he wants the fame, and he wants the fortune, and he, and he wants it all. And he's talking to this friend. He said, you know, you know what I am? What I think I am? I think I'm like a number one Billboard top hit. I'm a number one song. But it feels like that I'm always number two. And his friend looked at him and he said, you know what? Those number two songs are some pretty good songs. And you know what? We don't have to be number one in this world because we serve the one who truly is. Apostle Paul tells us as he closes. He says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling me. Paul tells us that we should press on. And so finally today, as we think about re re regret, I want to ask you a question. What are some things you'd never want to regret? I've got a few that I'd never like to regret. Here's what I want to share this with you. Ten things you'll never regret. You will never regret showing kindness to an older person. You will never regret destroying a letter that you write when you're mad. You will never regret offering an apology that restores a relationship. You will never regret stopping a scandal by ruin, stopping a scandal that was ruining a reputation. You will never regret helping a child see themselves the way God sees them. You will never regret taking time to show consideration to your parents, to your siblings, to your brothers and sisters, and to your friends. You'll never regret re refraining from gossip when everyone else around you is talking. You'll never regret refusing to do something that's wrong, even though everybody else is doing it. You'll never regret living your life according to your convictions. And most importantly, you will never regret following God and letting Him be the Lord of your life. Our God does not want us to live lives of regret.